Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Hey there, welcome to episode 50 of the Flavors Unknown podcast. Episode 50, wow. Okay, I know there's a ton of podcasts out there with much more episodes than that. But looking back, when I started in September 2018, I remember dreaming about reaching episode 50 when I was still learning the ABC of podcasting. I made it to episode 50, and this is because of all of you listening to my podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you as well for interacting with me on Instagram and direct messaging. You are giving me suggestions, feedback, and I love it. Please continue to do so. I hope the show is getting better because of this constant communication. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche, and I've been in the food industry for more than 20 years in Europe and in the US, and every other week, I interview trending chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders. Okay, now let's talk about today's episode. Chef Jose Garces introduced me to our new guest today. Her name is Charlotte Voisy, and she's the head ambassadors at William Grant & Sons in the US. In this episode, you will learn everything about the exciting job of being a brand ambassador at a spirit company. Charlotte is going to talk to us about cocktail making, of course, and the current trend in the industry. She will share with you her favorite gin and tonic recipe, ideal for this very hot summer month. If you are liking the podcast, why don't you give it a go and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown to stay tuned with the latest episode. Also, visit us at flavorsunknown.com and don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And now, here is my conversation with Charlotte Voicy. Hi, Charlotte. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. Hi, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you are more than welcome. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Um, I have to say that uh, I have uh, a high number of uh, chefs, uh, you know, that uh, accepted my invitation to, um, you know, to be on Flavors Unknown. Um, I do not have very often mixologists, so it's a special moment for me. Oh, that's great. Good. Well, I'm glad I can represent my uh, people. Yes. So you are a head of ambassador at William Grant and Sons. Yes. So this sounds very mysterious and at the same time very exciting. I don't know why, but uh, I, I just want to know what does a brand ambassador do? And then if you can talk as well a little bit about, you know, who is like William Grant and Sons, that would be great. Yeah, of course. So uh, just to set it up, William Grant and Sons are a family of distillers. For 130 years now, been making spirits, essentially single malt Scotch whiskey, but diversified the portfolio of spirits back in uh, the year 1999 when Hendrix Gin was launched. Since then, added to the portfolio, and we now have a portfolio of luxury spirits all around the world and still family owned. So it's still owned by the family of William Grant, who, who started everything, like I said, 130 years ago. So essentially, we are a liquor supplier globally. I live and work in the US, so concentrate on the market here, but travel a lot with work as well. So that's who the company is. And my role with the company is very exciting. Uh, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. And I get to work with the ambassadors that we have. And for us, brand ambassadors are all about brand embodiment. So we have ambassadors on all of our brands, and really it's their job to make people fall in love with our brands, right? So they bring the brand to life. It's like a human embodiment of Hendrix Gin or Glenfiddich Single Malt or the Balveni. We believe that we have fantastic liquids, right? Our distillers are world class, but we're also quite good at creating interesting brands and personalities for the brands. So we like to search for people whose personality fit those brands so that they can just really bring them to life for people and extend the brand into human interaction. Um, so when you so say bring into life, what, what does that mean exactly? What's the practical thing that uh, a brand ambassador do? 
it would mean that, for example, if you went to a Hendrix event or interacted with Hendrix in any way, you start to understand the look and feel of the brand. So not just what does it taste like, but how does it behave? So what's the personality? This would come in events. It would come through in printed materials, the way we talk about gin, the way we talk about cocktails. So really just giving like a personality, I guess, to the brand, because there are so many great spirits out there and we know that there are great gins out there. Hendrix is quite unique and different. So by adding a a human personality to it, we're able to describe the differences so that people understand where it sits within gin and why they might prefer Hendrix, for example, over other gins, because they uh, connect with the personality. Okay. So what are the skills and qualifications that you need to have to become a brand ambassador? So ultimately, what we look for is great personal skills, right? So the ability to truly connect with people. And that's often through charisma. It's through interest in personality. It's through having the confidence to be a great presenter in a room. Uh, We also look for some credibility, right? So you don't have to necessarily be um, a master bartender, but you need to have some degree of excellence and knowledge in a field so that you're interesting to talk to and people want to hear from you and hang out with you. So rather than having, you know, degrees or skills or operational expertise, what we look for are great connectors, people who are engaging to be around um, and can connect with people and communicate well so that they can display those traits of the brand and the personality. So those people organize, I would say, probably like test tasting, you know, events like throughout what the country for each of those brands. Yeah, exactly. The work of an ambassador is quite varied. So a lot of it is tasting events. So like your big food and wine events where we give consumers directly chance to try our brands in different cocktails or neat where we can tell the stories and, and educate around our brands. We also do uh, perhaps more intimate events where it's a higher level seminar. So sometimes getting really in depth into particular areas of knowledge. So within food and beverage, we might get very deep and technical on the history of cocktails, or it could be how to prepare different ingredients, or it could be a study on techniques, different trends that are happening in, in the industry, what's happening in different geographical areas of the world as to beverage and cocktails. So we do very large events. We do very sort of high level, more intimate seminars. Uh, we also do a lot of media and PR. So it could be a podcast interview or a radio interview or even on television, essentially be a spokesperson for the brand. There's a lot that an ambassador does to different audiences. We also have a lot to do with educating salespeople that work with us or distributors, especially in the US, who are a really key part of the, the puzzle. So anyone who's interested in our brands, it's education, but it's also a bit of entertainment. Because again, we want to transmit the spark and the passion behind the brands as well as information. So that sounds really exciting. Um, you see, as you said, a little bit glamorous as well. Is there a catch, you know, with that type of, <laughs> of job? Oh, listen, I've been doing this for nearly 15 years, so I haven't found the catch yet. It's a wonderful job and it's an an incredible experience. There's a lot of travel and you have access to experiences that most people will never see. The catch is that you are always on. Uh, You have to give a lot of yourself to the role. Trying to establish a work-life balance is very, very challenging. I think more so any regular job. Even when it comes to social media, which is a big part of the role as well, everything you do, anytime you leave your house and you're interacting with people, in a way you are representing your brand and the company you work for. So you're always on. You're always uh, representing someone else. And that can be exhausting at times. And it means you have less time for yourself and your own hobbies and your own thoughts and freedom. So that's, that's probably the catch. You give an awful lot of self to the role, which means some people can do it for just a few years. It also means it's really important to find a brand that you truly love and admire and a brand who has values that align with yours. Because if you truly give so much of yourself and your name and your reputation to a brand, it needs to feel comfortable. 
Absolutely. And so, uh, so I'm guessing that most of the brand ambassadors are, you know, when it comes to spirits, uh, came from the mixology and bartender uh, world. Is it correct? Yes, that's correct. Most of our team has and most of uh, ambassadors I see broadly in the industry have come from that background, but not all of them. Interestingly, some of our ambassadors have backgrounds in theatre or other creative areas. And it's great because what they bring is wonderful presence, stage presence. They're great presenters. They are very charismatic. They connect with people. So they have all of these skills that it's very difficult to teach someone. You can teach someone how to make drinks. You can explain to somebody about the history of whiskey. But it's very difficult to teach someone how to be confident and charismatic. So we're actually quite open-minded when it comes to what is the background of candidates that wish to become brand ambassadors. And like anything, we find that once you have diversity of background, diversity of thought, you actually start to build a more interesting team. And so how are you selected, you know, to become like a, a brand ambassador? Do you apply? Do you, is the brand uh, more like, uh, or yourself because you are coordinating, you know, different ambassadors? So are you looking for people and identifying people? How, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, within the industry, when we have roles open, we do have a lot of our own networks within the industry. So we normally start there and see if anybody is looking for work or anybody that we have admired for a while in the industry that has good work ethic and all of the traits I've discussed previously. So sometimes we we already know who's out there, but we also use, you know, the the necessary corporate tools for, for finding people. So whether it's communication via LinkedIn or using recruitment agencies, you know, we we write up job descriptions in a very different way for brand ambassadors. We try to describe the personality of the brand rather than just listing out duties and skills needed. And we find that that tends to attract more creative thinkers because we're already speaking language. So we do use some slightly different tools to a regular corporate position. And we lean a lot on the circles of the industry that we already know. Yes. And so what's your favorite thing? you, Charlotte, like about being in your role today? What do you like the most? The part about my job I do love the most is the travel. I have been so fortunate to travel the world with this work and just to places, experience people and cultures that I probably never would have seen before. And as you know, it's just such an enriching way to live life and, and learn. Now, yeah, now that I'm leading the program of ambassadors what i love the most is that i get to work with everyone and i get to help them and mentor them and encourage them and bring them up so that they too can have great experiences like i did when i started so i guess at the moment you're a little frustrated like um, you know i am <laughs> that's uh, because of the you know covid 19 that uh, you are uh, stuck at home so how do you um you know, you do your job then, you know, from, from your home. Yeah, it's, it has been very frustrating. What a challenging year for everyone. And I think the hospitality industry, the food and beverage world has been hit really hard. We are a few months in now and still bars and restaurants are struggling. It's been difficult. It's definitely changed my role and the way that ambassadors work. Fortunately, despite the year 2020 with all the challenges and COVID, we're still able to do our jobs from home. Because of social media um, and platforms, Zoom, we're still able to host events. We've done virtual tastings and happy hours where we can connect to, you know, two or 200 people at a time to show our brands, keep up to date with trends, keep connected with people. It's a very different way of working because the ambassador role is very social. And it's, it, yes, it's social media, but it's not social because you're never with anyone. So it's become quite but at least we can still do our job. And I'm pleased to say that with William Grant and Sons, we've managed to keep everyone employed and everyone quite busy and active. So while it's been challenging, at least we, we still have our jobs and we're still able to make an impact, which has been good. So let's go back a little bit in time. I'm curious to understand what compelled you to become a bartender. Yes, a long, long time ago. <laughs> no, not that long time ago. <laughs> it feels like it. I, I was never super clear about what I wanted to do. 
um, when I was smaller. So growing up, I tried to keep my options open. And I went to university for uh, hospitality management. And when I came out from, from university, I found a great company based in London that had a restaurant management program. I joined them. I stayed with them for about a year. I went to Spain, Argentina, and I learned about the business of restaurants. So how to manage a restaurant and all the departments within. And I really enjoyed it. I had a wonderful learning experience. I really enjoyed the social aspect of being in restaurants. In 2003, that same company started to get into cocktails because uh, London at the time was going through a cocktail renaissance. Classic culture was being reinstated. And that's when my career turned to focus on bartending and cocktails and mixology. And that was around 2003. We opened a cocktail bar called Apartment 195 in Chelsea in London. And I was the general manager, but also a bartender because it was a small bar. And that's when I really started to take bartending seriously. And from that experience, I got the opportunity to join William Grant and Sons in the U.S. to become a brand ambassador. And the, the vision behind that move was to connect brands with the bartender community um, because I, I know bartender community having come from there you know the language you know their passions you know uh, what they need how to support them so that was really the progression of, of my career from bartender to where I am now. So how long have you been an um, uh, ambassador then for William Grant and Son? Uh, since 2006 so oh, 2006 okay 14 years. Did you miss like the, um, uh, you know like the time when you were bartending I mean was it difficult to switch from bartender to um you know to ambassador because i'm guessing like the work-life balance the organization of your time and so on it's quite different yes you're absolutely right the biggest change for me was when you run a bar everything is clockwork right you arrive at the same time you have your opening duties you run the bar the closing you have inventory once a week everything is pretty much clockwork and what changes is the people that come in and obviously the night and it's a lot of fun but you have a routine, you know exactly where you are, you're in one spot. When you become a brand ambassador, everything changes. There is no routine, no two days are the same, no two weeks are the same, everything is different. And actually, it's quite exciting at first, because one week you're going to Miami, and then California, and then London, and it's very, very exciting. But after a while, uh, yes, I did miss bartending a lot. Being a brand ambassador can be quite lonely. It sounds strange to say that when we are throwing so many parties and being around people, but you're working by yourself a lot. When you're a bartender working in a bar, you have a family, right? You have the bar family, you have your regular guests. So there's a lot of things that I miss about bartending. I still get to be creative, of course. I still make, get to make drinks and serve people at events. So I still get a little bit of the bartender life, but it's a hard thing to leave behind. People who love to bartend, uh, it's, it, you do miss it for sure. Yeah. Do you think you will come back to it one day? Oh, uh, I don't know. The older I get, the harder it feels because bartending is, is very physical. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm capable of doing it now, but it takes a lot out of you. There's also the hours. The hours are difficult to balance. You talk about work-life balance for a bartender or anyone who works in, an, in a night venue. It's, it's difficult. So I would love to. The idea is very exciting to me. It would just depend on the status of my life and, and how I'm feeling physically. But I would love to be involved in a bar again. Yeah, of course. So let's talk a little bit about um, cocktail making. So I would like to know, uh, when it comes to making a cocktail, what's your approach? Are you looking for like a... Uh, first, like an overarching theme, and then you are building the different elements, you know, to reach out the theme that you have in mind uh, with specific ingredients, or it's the reverse, uh, that you are starting from the ingredients and, you know, the flavors of each ingredients, and you're building the tastes one at a time. I think it's the first. It's the overarching flavor idea. It's, um, okay. yeah, it's an overarching flavor combination that you have in mind or you're working towards. And then you start to pull together ingredients that will help you get there. And then within that, there's the theme of balancing. So you need to make sure everything is balanced in terms of 
not just sweet and sour and strength of the drink, but also the volume of different flavors and, and even texture and, and how all of that comes together. So, I, but I think there's, there's usually an overarching theme, unless the, the one time it would be different is when you start with a, a very specific brief, right? So, for example, in, in my world, it could be we have a new spirit. We have a new spirit and we need to develop some cocktails. So we're starting with the spirit. So the first thing I would do would be to nose it and taste it properly to understand the nuance and the characters that the spirit has. And then I would work on adding flavors one by one to draw them out until I reached a, a cocktail that showcased that spirit specifically. Can you give us an example, maybe with uh, like the first uh, scenario that you mentioned with the overarching, you know, theme or, or flavor idea that you have in mind? Maybe something that you have done recently or something which is connected to, you know, one of your iconic brands? Yeah. So, for example, one of our brands is Monkey Shoulder. It's a blended scotch. But the whole premise around monkey shoulder is that it's made for mixing. So it's not a traditional scotch that you sit down and sip neat. It is designed to be mixing cocktails. So for monkey shoulder, what we wanted to do was push the idea of scotching cocktails uh, as extreme as possible to get this message across. So we would come up with an overarching idea of making a scotch tiki cocktail, for example, or a scotch cocktail with tropical flavors something you wouldn't normally expect. So that's the goal, right? It has to be something that, that looks like it's probably a rum drink. It could be served by the pool. It could be blended. It could be with crushed ice. You might find it in a tiki bar. So that's the goal. And then you work backwards to fit in monkey shoulder. So you would then come bring in different elements, like you would expect some big tropical flavors. So does that come from fresh pineapple? Does it come from like a tiki? Bitters. Would you use an orgiac simple syrup instead of just a regular sugar? Uh, so you, you start from that, like, what are you trying to achieve? How does it need to taste? And how does the temperature need to be? How does it need to look? And then you work backwards rather than looking at monkey shoulder like a scotch and then thinking about scotch cocktails. So that would be one of them. Okay. But does it taste like a, like a scotch, like the monkey shoulder? It absolutely yeah. does, but that doesn't mean okay. that the only cocktails you can make with it need to taste like scotch, right? Like mm -hmm. most yeah, scotch yeah, cocktails, quite simple. You would stick to like a Rob Roy or an old fashioned style drink. They're really, it's all about the flavor of the whiskey. But like you put monkey mm -hmm. in a colada or a tiki cocktail and all of a sudden you're tasting tropical fruits and the monkey shoulder flavor just has layers within that, but it doesn't dominate. So where do you turn to for, for inspiration when you want to create something new? I try to keep a broad as window as I can for inspiration, for creativity. I look a lot at food. I think it's only natural that when you see food flavors come together, you can understand how similar things can work in drinks, particularly um, the sort of garnish on food and pastry as well more so it might be salads and appetizers and uh, desserts i think often give me a lot of ideas for cocktails i also look to see what other people in my profession are doing so looking at interesting new menus anytime a, a good bar has a new menu launch i try to you know attend the event in the old world or just uh, read up online what flavors they are doing that can give me inspiration even if you don't have the recipe, that's, that's better because then you just have an idea of flavors that work together. And then you can build your own recipes. I think that nature and the seasons offer a lot of creativity. Just the colors and the aromas that we see in nature around us, especially when we travel, right? Because anything that's new and interrupts your normal is an opportunity to be inspired and to get creative. Maybe let's try to go in your maybe memory here, <laughs> memory lane. And, and maybe if, can you share maybe something that you have experienced? You were talking about food. So you were talking uh, an appetizer or desserts or something that was a garnish, you know, into one of those uh, dishes. If there's anything that you have encountered, like, um, you know, and tasted recently that um, inspired you? Um, let's see. Well, one thing uh, a few years ago now, but 
it's a, quite a, a simple idea, but using arugula in a cocktail wasn't something that was very common. It's still not very common. But uh, for me, arugula has, it's a great aroma. And I think it instantly reminds people of Italian food, whether it's a, a pizza or some kind of fresh salad. So when you're designing a cocktail to be an aperitif, so something that would be drunk before dinner, the whole point of an aperitif is to prepare the palate, right? To open up the palate, to get ready to eat. So the use of the aromas of arugula is in a cocktail is great because it takes you straight to thinking about food. So I made a arugula gimlet with Hendrix a couple of years ago for a specific occasion where it was the drink right before dinner and it was an Italian dinner that we were having. And it just specifically set everyone on the right path to then enjoy their dinner. If you had it by itself, it would still be delicious and balanced, but it wouldn't that's not really the point. It was specifically done to lead into the meal. You were mentioning that uh, nature was something very important for you in terms of a source of inspiration. So can you share with us maybe an example in one of uh, the travel that you have done where nature inspired you? Yes. So last year, I was lucky enough to visit both Colombia and Costa Rica. And in both places, we went to visit a coffee plantation. And, um, you know, I drink coffee regularly. It's not a new ingredient to me. And I've even used it in drinks before. But when you actually learn the whole process of how coffee grows, the aromas of the coffee flower, how the coffee berries are picked, how they're processed, and then experiencing coffee tasting like a cupping, my world was just opened in terms of the different flavors of coffee and then how they can be balanced in a drink to draw out maybe a more citrusy side or a spicy side or a fruity side. So that was a really great experience which is unforgettable because I was literally in the in nature, in the coffee plantation, seeing and, and breathing in and, and enjoying the aromas. And then you learn about the production. So coffee for me after that trip just uh, exploded with opportunities for cocktails. What did you uh, pair, um, you know, then um, the, those new profiles of coffee with? Yep. So a couple of things using cold extraction on coffee because it's a little bit more gentle to get the flavors. And actually, it was a lot of citrus that citrus notes that came from that coffee experience that was new to me. I never really associated bright citrus notes with coffee before. Before then, it had always been, you know, darker notes and mixing with rum or whiskey, whereas the citrus notes allowed us to make drinks with, with Hendrix or, or with a Pisco or a vodka. And then also the flowers themselves. Um, using the flowers and either steeping them in a neutral spirit or a vodka to extract some flavor or just using them for garnish. Um, they're quite aromatic, and it allows you then to talk about the fact that it's a, a flower from a coffee bush and then how coffee grows and just opens the conversation. So what's your favorite spirit and why? Well, it's hard to pick, but I would have to say gin. Gin because uh, there's so many opportunities. I respect well-made gins because much like a cocktail, actually, you you have to balance flavor. So gin is essentially neutral grain spirit plus a recipe of botanicals that comes together to make the house gin taste, is the style. So it's in a similar way to balancing flavor as we do in cocktails. That's what a gin recipe does. So it, it makes sense to me. It's wonderful. It's quite magical when you take it a very, when you take an assortment of exotic botanicals and spices from all around the world and they come together to make a new flavor. It's quite exciting. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, every gene obviously have, you know, different balance of botanicals, uh, you know, in them. And I, I have to say that I really love the one from, from Hendrix. And what was like the, the strategy of then out of the company to launch not too long ago? I think the past, um, you know, few years, like two different, uh, special, like, um, you know, edition from, from Hendrix with different blends in terms of botanicals. Can you talk a little bit about those? So we've had Hendrix now for about 20 years. Um, and you're right. It was a couple of years ago. We started to release some new editions of Hendrix. And these come from what we call the cabinet of curiosities. So behind Hendrix, our master distiller is Leslie Gracie. She is wonderful. She's uh, very creative and an excellent distiller. And what we realized was uh, she has a lot 
of other things she can do. So we wanted to showcase Leslie's talent by releasing limited editions of Hendrix. So we had, for example, Hendrix Orbium, which is the base of Hendrix Gin. And then we add a couple of extra botanicals to make a very different style of gin. In the case of Orbium, we added wormwood and quinine and lotus blossom. So the addition of three botanicals here changed the result of the gin very much. Orbium is even rounder as a spirit. That's the way Leslie likes to describe spirits in shapes. So it's quite round. It has a wonderful mouthfeel. And then the addition of quinine and wormwood make Orbium a little bit drier than classic Hendrix. And therefore, it performs differently in cocktails, which is, you know, really interesting for us to compare and see. And then the second one we launched was Midsummer, so Hendrix Midsummer Solstice. And this was to really celebrate flowers that are at their peak in the middle of summer. So we've just passed summer solstice in, in this year. And so this edition of gin is Hendrix plus extra florals and already in Hendrix recipe the classic recipe we have four different flowers and the midsummer solstice just really dials that up so the aroma is more floral the flavor is more floral but you still have the same structure and, and backbone that Hendrix gin delivers was it the, like the same you know blossoms were used or there was additional ones that were added additional blossoms added for midsummer solstice yes have you um identify or discover like uh, uh, unique and uh, maybe new ingredients that uh, you have been experimenting with in uh, some of your cocktail recipe recently? Yes. I've, uh, for example, re recently I created a cocktail with corn and used a corn liqueur. Uh, it was a new, new liqueur on the market. It's called Nixta and it's from Mexico. We see a lot of movement in Latin flavors and specifically ingredients from Mexico are more and more popular at the moment. Tequila had a big boom. Mezcal became very popular. We now see different spirits made from agave like sopol coming through. And there's a whiskey made from corn from Mexico and now Nixta, which is the corn liqueur. So I recently played around with that a little bit and came up with some different cocktails that showcase the corn flavor, uh, Mexican cuisine as well is very popular. So I think that's a nice one to, to bring to people as an option at the moment. I just want to come back to, um, to gin and one moment. We have seen like uh, in the past years, a big trend, uh, kind of a revival, you know, of gin and every little distilleries around the country have launched, um, you know, their own gin. So what's your take, uh, you know, on this? Yeah, gin has exploded. In the UK, it's absolutely crazy. But in America as well, a lot more gin. I think, you know, when I started bartending, there were four or five gins. Uh, I think Hendrix actually did a lot to open up the category by introducing different flavors like cucumber and rose. People just became aware that gin can be made from anything. It, it's not just about cucumber. So I think... That was one reason. And then the second reason is craft distilling, right? So when craft distilling kind of came back to America in, a, in the mid 2000s, when Hudson opened in, in upstate New York, the first license since prohibition, that's how long it had been since we started having local distilleries and a lot of movement in Colorado. Now we have craft distilleries in every city in America and most of them their plan is to make whiskey, which is great, but it takes time. You have to let it sit in barrels for some, some years. So what do these distilleries do? They put out vodka, they put out gin because it's a lot quicker to make and it gives them a chance to shoot their distilling style. So I think that has also contributed to the number of gins that are on the market in America. And of course, bartenders love to work with gin because it's the original spirit of the cocktail. Um, and it's so versatile in cocktails. So it was almost like a perfect storm, I think, for gin. So what are like the trends that you see um, in uh, the cocktail world at the moment? There's, uh, there's lots of trends still in cocktails. Uh, we've seen, for example, things like uh, the, the clarified milk punch was a trend from a few years ago that still mm -hmm. seems to be popular at the moment. Tiki continues to be popular, but not just rum. It's 
broadened out to other spirits. The appreciation of Latin flavors, like I mentioned, but that also includes things like pisco, which I think people are starting to understand a little bit more. Uh, flavors from Asia. The influence of Japanese bartending is uh, huge at the moment. We see, for example, there's a bar in New York City called Katana Kitten, which is an homage to a Japanese style bar and restaurant. Their style of cocktails are very trendy at the moment. They won Best New American Cocktail Bar last year. And we're starting to see some spirits as well from Asia, from China and Taiwan, things like Baiju, which uh, it, most people have never heard of. And they're quite, but they're very different spirits in the way that they're made and the way that they taste. But they're starting to come over. They're starting to attract some attention. And maybe in 10, 20 years, there'll be household names and they might even replace, you know, some of our most common drinks now. It's always interesting to watch the beginning of trends. Like I remember when Mezcal was just starting to get popular and, and starting to be imported into the US. And now it's everywhere. Uh, so it's quite exciting to see trends when they start to come and then you watch them grow. Talking about this, I mean, if there's any trend that you are kind of like tired of and you would like see maybe them gone? I think for me, any anything that doesn't actually add quality to the drink and, you know, it's just a gimmick. It's interesting. I was thinking about this question because we're in a world where Instagram is king, right? And so many cocktails these days are designed for the way that they look so that they look great on Instagram and people share them and you, you get awareness and custom that way, which is great. And I think it's fine and it's good, but it runs the risk of people making drinks just to look good rather than the way that they taste or the quality of the ingredients they're made with. So I would just be careful about that trend of making cocktails just for Instagram rather than the, the quality of flavor and the opportunity to pair with food for the guests. And I think maybe as well, it's, um, uh, it's maybe for um, bartenders, you know, they could be tired of doing uh, like the same type of cocktails because it's kind of like a, a big fad at one moment and they have to make like hundred of them, you know, in like uh, in maybe in a week, uh, which maybe it's a little bit different for you being, a, you know, a brand ambassador. You are not, you know, facing that situation on the, on a daily basis <laughs> and being, you know, yeah. tired of a trend. Yeah, you're very right. Yeah, that's it's different. We would we would be better to ask some some working bartenders that question. Let's think about a recipe that uh, you know someone can do at home. And as you said, you love gin, and this is like summertime, so I I love making gin and tonic, you know, at home with different botanicals and you know different spices and even different gin. But if uh, what would be your let's say, your inspiration or your, your advice for an amateur bartender at home to prepare a, like a unique kind of a new style gin and tonic and maybe with kind of a Charlotte uh, Voisey like uh, signature. <laughs> yeah, so the, the gin and tonics are wonderful refreshment, right? Especially in summertime. And it's a simple enough drink, but if you pay attention to every ingredient and every element of the cocktail, you can get a really, really elevated good experience yes yeah, so i have a, a saying i refer to which is excellent drinks can be made from nothing but excellent ingredients and i like to refer to that because it reminds me that you get out what you put in so for something as simple as the gin and tonic it's about choosing a gin that you love or a good quality gin the best you can afford and maybe tasting it first and then comparing it with a tonic water that's also well made. So these days we live in a very lucky time where we have great quality mixes. So there's brands like Eva Tree and Q Mixers, Fentimans, they all offer different flavors of tonic now. So you can actually experiment with the flavor of tonic water. For example, Hendrix goes very well with elderflower tonic water. You can also do simple things like chilling down your glassware in the fridge or freezer before you use it, before you serve your gin and tonic. It will keep your gin and tonic nice and cool. If you stick to the smaller bottles of tonic, it means that your tonic will always be nicely, sharply carbonated, which is a nicer texture to have in your mouth rather than buying a very large bottle 
and then slowly and surely it loses carbonation. So at the end of the week or the next week, you've lost half of the magic of the gin and tonic. You have so ice. So if you can make some larger ice cubes in your freezer, it will keep the temperature of your drink colder for longer and it will look nicer, your gin and tonic. And then, like you mentioned, have some fun with the garnish. So whether it's using fresh cucumber, fresh orange peel, you can also pick up some flowers, whether dried or fresh, and throw them in gin and tonic. And anything with some aroma, so whether that's a little bit of coriander seed or juniper berry if you have it. Otherwise, you express the lemon and orange peel on the top of your drink so that the drink smells fresh. Um, as you know, with food and drink, we taste first by aroma. So when we smell something we like, we've already kind of told our stomach to expect something delicious. Um, and it really does add to the experience. So I think even something as simple as a gin and tonic, if you pay attention to the excellence of each ingredient and each step of making the drink, you can really, you know, make something that's special and impress your guests, something that looks wonderful. Um, so you can, you know, it's more of a special occasion rather than just having a drink at the end of a hard day. I always do this, um, you know, when I have guests or, or barbecue, it's, it's having, a, you know, on the table, like a whole set of, um, you know, several gins and then, uh, and then all those ingredients. In fact, I, I got the idea um, when I was traveling to uh, Cuba, when, you know, Cuba was um, open. <laughs> And uh, I discovered, I was very surprised, I went to a bar there and they had an outstanding menu and it was a gin menu where you could pick your gin brand and then you, you will pick the, you know, type of glass and then you will pick after that, you know, like the tonic brand and then all different ingredients. So you could add, you know, different spices, different botanicals, different blossoms and so on. And I thought it was like really, really great experience. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I try to do that, um, you know, several times during the, during the summer. It's pretty, and people usually love that. Yeah, it's a great idea. I want to ask you a series of rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Okay. It's a ladies' night in, I would say now, because there's probably not a lot of ladies' night out. So <laughs> with the, the quarantine, so... What uh, recipe or what kind of drink would you suggest to prepare for a ladies nine in? So I would recommend preparing a bottle of pre-made Negronis or even martinis. Uh, with both of those drinks, you can make them in advance, add a little dilution, keep them chilled in the refrigerator. And when you're ready to serve, you can just pour over ice or pour into a martini glass and you're good to go. Are you tequila or mezcal? Tequila. If you would have to select a drink that you can have for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, Only one. 75. French 75. Okay. Yes. What's your favorite drink to make? Favorite drink to make? Well, now that I'm not a bartender in a bar, I'm going to say the Ramos Gin Fizz. It's a drink that takes a long time to make. It's very arduous, but it looks beautiful. And it gives me a wonderful sense of satisfaction, as long as I don't have them over and over for eight hours. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So what, what, what is that drink and what's in it? Yeah, it's a historic recipe from New Orleans from the 1800s. And it's a morning drink. So it's gin with orange blossom flower water, cream, a fresh egg white, some lemon juice, some lime juice, and a little bit of sugar. And the trick is that you have to shake it for a very long time without any ice. And then you strain it into a chilled highball glass without any ice. And you top it with a little bit of soda water. And it grows up beyond the glass to a beautiful froth. Um, it's a delicious, delicate cocktail. And it's a morning drink, like I said. So what better reason than that? <laughs> what is the cheekiest cocktail that you have uh, ever invented? Cheekiest cocktail. Maybe like uh, one time we did a clarified watermelon gimlet. So it's cheeky because when you serve it, it looks like a martini. Uh, it looks clear. And then you taste it and it tastes exactly like watermelon because that's what it's made from, fresh watermelon. And it tricks the person who's drinking it because you think you're getting something and then you taste it and it, and it completely 
is some a different flavor, then you can see in people's faces how confused they are. If there is um, any books, so I don't know if it's cookbook because you were saying that you could be inspired inspired by food. So um, the cookbooks or bartender books that uh, inspire you the most. So maybe like two or three if you have in mind. Um, yes. So books that I love that inspire me would include the Flavor Bible, uh, which is primarily a food book, but it talks a lot about flavors and how they work together. Also, The Bar Book by Jeffrey Morgenthaler. It's a very uh, straightforward book with good advice and recipes and some fun stories. And then also The Craft of the Cocktail by Dale DeGroff. It's one of the first books that we read as bartenders. covers a lot of the very classic cocktails. In your role of, um, you know, ambassador, uh, you said that you have to create, you know, events, you know, about a brand. If there's like a, a specific event that you have created uh, or you were part of that was most of the most, I would say, outstanding immersive experience that you have lived? I would say it was the Peculiar Palace, which is an event that we created last year for Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans in July of last year. And it was a Hendrix Gin event. We took over a beautiful theater and we recreated the space entirely to bring the world of Hendrix alive. Each expression of Hendrix that we've mentioned earlier, so Orbia, Midsummer, and Hendrix, had its own room. And we completely decorated and brought in elements to bring those three gins alive. Um, my favorite part was the room with Midsummer Solstice. We had, it was filled with flowers. It smelled beautiful. And halfway through the experience, some of the flowers started moving and they were actually attached to a, an actor who had stilts on. So the flowers and the trees would uncurl themselves and start to walk around the room. And people were so surprised and delighted because they didn't expect it. Um, some of them squealed a little bit. But it was it was beautiful, um, and it's just great to to make people smile and and surprise them. So that was probably the most immersive, most effective event we've done recently. It's wonderful. I wish I would have been there. <laughs> so uh, let's finish with um, one last rapid fire question. So if you were a flavor, what flavor would you be? I would be strawberry. Strawberry. Why? I was a summer baby, so I always like to think of summer flavors. I think it's very British, um, strawberries and cream. So it links me mm -hmm. back to, to my roots. It looks good. It goes well in drinks. And I don't think I know anybody who doesn't like strawberries. Okay. Thank you very much, Charlotte. I really appreciate the time that you have uh, giving us and um, being um, a guest on Flavors Unknown. Thank you very much for having me. There it is. Episode 50 with Charlotte Voicy is over. Ambassador for Spirit Company. Pretty cool job, no? Thank you, Charlotte, for sharing it with us. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, share it with one of your friends who is a cocktail enthusiast, for instance. I know I keep asking you guys to share this podcast. It is, in fact, the best way for me to grow my audience, word of mouth. So keep it in mind next time you are chatting with your friends. Ask them if they know about the podcast Flavors Unknown. Remember as well to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown. I have another freebie for you guys this week. Go to itinerary.flavorsunknown.com forward slash episode 50 and you can download some cocktail recipes and Charlotte Voice's approach to gin and tonic that you just heard talking about. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. You've just enjoyed another delicious episode of Flavors Unknown. Hungry for more? Hit subscribe. Tell us where you're listening from by leaving a review. And for social media and show notes, head to flavorsunknown.com.